Hello and welcome. I am Professor Rashmi Raman and this is our third and last module on the modes of liability. This module is titled Modes of Liability Part 3 or Other Modes of Liability. Learning Outcomes In this module, I would like you to learn about specific liability under international criminal law. Secondly, I would like to offer a brief explanation of all the concepts under specific, specific liability which include aiding, abetting, attempt, conspiracy and incitement. These will be given as lecture notes along with this module. With the increase in the number of ethnic, racial, religious and various intra-regional conflicts, there is an impending need to come up with measures which uphold the value of life and prevent the commission of acts which may cause harm to humanity and disrupt the peace of society. But there are certain prerequisites which are required to be met before the commencement of these acts or offences or certain cases where there are persons assisting the perpetrator of the crime and whose assistance would significantly help in the final commission of this offence. To ensure that these prerequisite measures taken or cases of assistance given do not translate or lead to the commission of an actual offence, international courts and tribunals have formulated methods and precedents which are aimed to prevent the, commence the beginning of an offence. In this module, concepts of specific liability will be discussed. These are ideas that are ancillary to actual criminal instigation. Um, they will be looked at and I will also give you relevant case law to analyze to understand them. Let us begin with aiding and abetting. As we have discussed before, there could be cases where um, a person or a number of people assist the principal perpetrator of a crime. In these cases or situations, it is not necessary that the person have intricate details of the offence which is committed or going to be committed. A person may simply participate in the crime without sharing the same knowledge or intention but by acting as an accessory to the crime and by giving practical assistance, moral support or encouragement in the commission of the crime. However, the assistance given must be of some significance or have some substantial effect in the commission of the crime. A person may also be liable um, by their mere presence during the commission of an offence as we will observe further on. However, this presence must be accompanied by intention. For a person to be liable under aiding and abetting, it is not necessary that the person who is acting as an accessory and the principal perpetrator share a common intention. All that the person who is providing the assistance is required to know is that his act will provide substantial assistance in the commission of a final offence. For example, A is a military general who has planned to kill a group of people who are trying to illegally infiltrate a state's border. A takes three soldiers, namely B, C and D, along with him to kill his targets. They eventually kill the infiltrators. Even though B, C and D may not share the same knowledge as A or might have knowledge of the complete plan, but they will be held liable for aiding and abetting because they carried guns to the target position, knowing that their act will have a substantial effect on the final commission of an offence. This issue also arose in the trial, the famous trial really, of Franz van Anrath. In that case, the accused was charged with supplying chemical raw materials to the government of Iraq, which used the materials to manufacture mustard gas and used it allegedly against the Kurdish community, an ethnic minority community in Iraq. The Hague Court of Appeals held that under aiding and abetting of an offence, 
The accused need not share common intention with that of the perpetrators of the crime. But it is enough to know that their act will have had a substantial impact on the commission of the crime and would also have made it easier for the perpetrators of the crime to perpetrate the crime. Secondly, assistance provided may also be physical and tangible or moral and intangible. In the trial of Franz Schoenfeld and others, where the defendants had been charged for murdering three allied soldiers who were hiding in the house of a member of the Dutch resistance, the Advocate General, on the role of accessories not present at the scene of the crime, said that if the accessory was not physically present, but was positioned at a convenient distance to facilitate the escape of the perpetrators, or was watching the area to prevent any surprise or could readily come to the assistance if required and the perpetrators knew about the role of the accessory or the presence of the accessory, then the accessory is said to have aided and abetted in the commission of an offence. To decide whether merely the presence of a person during the commission of an offence qualifies to be considered under aiding and abetting or not, it has become an interesting legal issue. The case law has observed that mere presence may qualify as aiding and abetting when such presence acts as a source of substantial encouragement to the crime. The consequence is that the perpetrator draws moral support or the mere presence of the person may act as a legitimizing effect for the perpetrator. This is possible in a situation where the person who is present and is giving support has a greater status in society or in military hierarchy. To give an example, uh, where mere presence was considered as aiding and abetting, one might speak about the synagogue case. In a foregoing module, we have had an occasion to discuss this case. In 1948, the German Supreme Court held that one of the defendants in the synagogue case was found guilty because of his intermittent involvement and his status as a long-time militant for the Nazi party and also his knowledge of the criminal enterprise that was held to have encouraged and further supported the perpetrators in their actions. Even though he was neither physically present nor was he involved in the actual planning or instigation or even the perpetration of the act. A contrary opinion is seen in the Pig Cart Parade case. This was decided by the same court and we have referred to this case in a previous module where one of the defendants who wore a civil dress uh, attended a parade where two members of the party opposing the Nazis were to be humiliated. But he took no part in the humiliation. The court found that the defendant's approval could not be gleaned considering both subjectively and objectively that silent approval does not necessarily contribute to causing the offence and in no way meets the standards of criminal liability. What about incitement as participation? Instigation to an offence. Incitement means taking all possible psychological or physical steps to provoke a person to actually commit or execute a crime. The intent for the crime to be perpetuated is also required. But to consider incitement as a crime, there are three elements which need to be satisfied. One, the incitement must be direct and explicit. Two, the person indulging in incitement must possess the mens rea for the crime that he or she is instigating and must at least be aware of the likelihood that the commission of the crime would be a consequence of their action. And three, that the commission or execution of the crime by other persons must follow. Take for example, X tells Y to go and murder a family of five homosexuals who are living in the neighborhood and tells him that if he does not kill them, they will continue to pollute the neighborhood with their perverted methods. 
Y goes and kills the group of the five homosexuals. Here X will be liable for instigating Y because he has the prerequisite knowledge that at his instigation Y will go and his actions will lead to the murder of five people and thus he also had the required intention. Also his instigation was followed by the actual execution of the crime by Y and therefore he directly instigated Y to commit the crime. This principle of instigation was held to be true in the case of Kurt Meyer, a commander of the 25 SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment, who was accused to have incited and counseled his troops to deny quarter to Allied troops in the years 1943 and 44 in Belgium and France. Keeping in mind that denial of quarters is an offence in the Canadian military uh, code. The Canadian military court sitting in Germany found him guilty and held that any officer can be convicted of a war crime if he is found to have incited and counselled the troops under his command to deny quarter, not keeping in mind the intended result occurred or not. Let us now talk about inchoate crimes or crimes really without a backbone. International criminal law punishes not only conclusive criminal behavior such as murder etc but also inchoate or incomplete crimes. Inchoate crimes are preliminary or prohibited offenses. Those that are incomplete, those that have not caused any actual harm but are still punishable. Inchoate crimes have been criminalized for the main reason of protecting society. By intervening in this preparatory or incipient stage of an offense, international criminal law preempts the completion of these offenses and precludes the harmful consequences that may arise should they be seen all the way through to perpetration. In most common law states, Three categories of offences are seen to fall under the title of an inchoate crime. One, attempt. Two, conspiracy. Three, incitement. Under international criminal law, attempt falls under a general class of inchoate offences. Since most civil law states do not recognise conspiracy as a criminal offence, only conspiracy to commit genocide is a punishable offence under, under international criminal law. Incitement is strictly prohibited to genocide because connecting it to other crimes would greatly broaden the range. In addition to those that I have spoken about, any ordering or planning in pursuance of committing an international crime is punishable because most large-scale international crimes are a result, directly or indirectly, of orders issued by military or political leaders. Within the general category of inchoate crimes, there exist at least three discrete subcategories. One, criminal conduct that is preparatory to a crime, where the criminal act is not completed. An example of this is attempt. Two, Criminal conduct that is preparatory to crimes proper and is punished per se, whether or not the consummation of the crime follows. However, this is not punishable on its own. The reason is that when the crime is completed, the preparatory conduct is absorbed into it. If the preparatory agent and the perpetrator of the, of the crime are the same. If not, one will be held responsible for the inchoate crime the other for the actual commission of the crime. Examples of this category of uh, crime include planning as well as conspiracy to wage aggression. Three, criminal conduct that is punishable per se. Example, incitement to commit genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide and ordering and instigation. Now we shall discuss attempt. Attempt as a distinct criminal offence occurs whenever a person intending to commit a crime tries to carry it out without however the normal outcome 
of the action resulting from the attempt. Attempt may take two possible routes and these two possible routes make two different categories. One that the perpetrator makes attempts but others then stop it. Two, the perpetrator makes attempts but due to circumstances independent of his will, the act he intends to carry out does not follow through. The first possibility can be demonstrated through an example. Let us take the example of a soldier who attempts to beat a prisoner of war with the intention of killing him. But he is dragged off from the prisoner by others, therefore not being able to execute the crime. Two, let's take an example of a military officer who gives orders to blow up an internment camp in order to kill a specific ethnic group of male civilians. He is stopped in his act by the arrival of a superior officer who stops his troops from lighting the dynamite stick, which would then have set the internment camp on fire. The second possibility can be demonstrated using also some examples. Let's take an example of a, of a soldier who attempts to shoot a prisoner of war with the intention of killing him, but the soldier somehow manages to escape without fatal wounds. Let's also take another example of a military officer who gives order to a military unit to fire missiles against a group of civilian. Now the missile launcher gets stuck or misfires, causing no damage to the civilian group. Now despite the fact that there are no victims of these two attempted act, international criminal law makes the act of attempt itself punishable in order to protect a violation of the rules and principles of war codified in the Geneva Conventions. Almost all penal codes in the world recognize attempt as a separate mode of liability. This can be inferred from the numerous cases where courts have decided on the notion of attempt in cases of war. For instance, in the case of Johann Knights, the case was of an attempted murder decided in a Canadian court of law. Another example could be in the Charles W. Keenan case where the issue was of attempted murder. In this case, the accused was given orders to shoot at a civilian woman. It turned out that she was already dead from a previous shot fired by a superior officer. But a US court of military appeal held that, that the person would be liable for attempted murder if the facts of the situation were as he believed them to be. In the case in question, the accused and two others testified that the accused knew he was shooting at a corpse, hence he was acquitted. In Germany, there were many cases uh, revolving around attempted murder. For example, Karl Dietrich. The case dealt with the ill-treatment of Jews. The court of Assizes, however, ruled out attempted murder on the facts. Many other German courts have held that attempted murder could not be admissible in crimes relating to war, as seen in the case of P and V and O, three cases that are famous from the German courts. In the case of Roger D. Thomas, a case of attempted rape, the ingredients of this offence were discussed to be an overt act with specific intent, with more than mere preparation, tending to effect the commission of an offence and the failure to effect its actual commission. Certain international tribunals apprehended attempted murder as a crime against humanity and incorrectly charged them with other offences. In the case of Vasiliev, for example, a Bosnian Serb, together with three others, who had allegedly taken seven civilians to the bank of the river Derna and had opened fire at them. Five of these civilians died from fatal wounds and the remaining two pretended to be shot and jumped into the river to save themselves. The court held the accused liable for five murders and for the attempted murders of the other two and charged them with inhuman acts as a crime against humanity. This judgment was challenged in another case 
where the trial chamber spoke of 12 attempted murders and the law that was set forth in this case was eventually overruled. Thus, the customary rule on attempt can be inferred from the cases discussed. This rule has been codified in Article 25.3f of the Statute of the International Criminal Court, which states that if a person is criminally liable, he attempts to commit a crime by taking substantial steps to, com to commence the execution of such a crime, even if the crime itself does not actually take place because of external circumstances that are not within his individual control or controlled by his individual will. The ingredients of attempt can be distilled from this discussion. One, significant steps need to be taken towards the commencement of the crime. That is, it is not sufficient for a guard, for example, to take a prisoner out of his cell and shout at him in order to be liable under the offence of attempted murder. It needs to be shown that he savagely beat the prisoner. 2. The intention to commit the crime needs to be established and clear. 3. The failure of the act should have been caused by circumstances independent of the will of the accused, that is, interference by a third party or interference by circumstances outside of the control of the accused. The Rome Statute Article 25 Clause 3 Sub Clause F also takes into account the end point of the attempter's criminal intention. The statute tells us that if a person completely and voluntarily gives up the attempt to, to commit a crime or prevents the commission before the actual offence takes place, he will not be held liable under the statute for this. For example, if an officer gives orders to kill a group of civilians, but he changes his mind before the orders are carried out, thereby preventing the murder of these civilians, he would not be held liable for attempted murder. Just like in many common law and civil law jurisdictions, the International uh, Criminal Court given by the rules of ICL also requires the subjective element of mental intent or mens rea. Let us now look at another inquiet, prime planning. Planning consists of devising, two, agreeing upon with others, three, preparing and four, arranging. Planning implies that one or several persons contemplate designing the commission of a crime at both preparatory and execution phases. In international criminal law, higher military and civilian authorities mainly carry out criminal offences. The higher the status of the planner and the intensity and level of his participation, the higher will be the punishment and the accountability for the planning, irrespective of which stage of planning we are talking about. The subjective ingredient of mens rea is an essential element of the offence of planning. As decided in the case of Brina and others, as well as in Blaskic trial chamber decision. Trial chambers of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda too have opted for punishing planning as a criminal offence only if it is followed by an actual execution of a crime, in the case of Musema. These decisions were made in accordance with the International Law Commission and the statute of the ICTR which in Article 6, Clause 1 lays down the principle that the planning of a crime should actually lead to the commission of that crime in order for the foregoing process, that of planning, to constitute an inchoate crime in its own right. However, a ruling of an ICTY trial chamber in Kordich and Serkes held that planning alone may be a criminal offence under Article 7.1 of the statute. The trial chamber did, however, set forward two obstacles in the decision that mere planning constitutes a discrete form of responsibility under Article 7. The first obstacle is that if in committing the crime, the person doing so will not be held responsible for planning and secondly, that an individual may only be held liable for planning a crime if he intended 
on it actually being committed as a crime. There now exists the problem of a distinct dearth of case laws relating to this particular field of law that is planning without it being followed by the perpetration of an act. An international crime is punishable as a distinct form of criminal responsibility subject to a set case of conditions. In the case of planning, these conditions are that only the planning of a crime of massive proportions may be construed as a crime per se. That is, even if it did not result in a crime. This could be the planning of a genocide or mass deportation. This may be construed in such a way as to conclude that in cases of crimes of less significance or impact, the principle of planning would favor the accused. Thus, in the latter kinds of cases, this would not be held as crimes per se. Two, if the individual in question commits a crime, then he can no longer be held liable for planning. The subsequent execution of a crime means that the foregoing stage of planning may no longer be held to be a distinct crime in its own right. This has been held by a number of cases such as Cordage, Bredanen, Brema and others. The act of planning may however be held to be an aggravating factor in the overall prosecution. The ICT by trial chamber in Stasich and Brema held this. Regarding the requisite mens rea, it is necessary for the accused to have intended for the crime to be committed when he was planning it or to have a reasonable idea that it would indeed be carried out either by himself or by others. Now we come to the next inchoate crime, the crime of conspiracy. Conspiracy is defined as an agreement between two or more people to commit an illegal act along with the intent to achieve the goal of the agreement. Conspiracy is considered as an offence and is punishable under common law but is not punishable under civil law countries unless it leads to the execution of an actual crime. In international criminal law, however, conspiracy is only punishable when it is a conspiracy regarding the crime of genocide or where the crime itself is conspiracy to commit genocide which is the use of force and harmful means to eliminate a particular race, ethnic or religious group, etc. We have already gone into genocide in significant detail in foregoing modules, notwithstanding whether the genocide occurs or not. The ICTR has held in the case of Musema that conspiracy to commit genocide is defined as an agreement between two or more persons to commit the crime of genocide. The only treaty provision on genocide is Article 3b of the 1948 Genocide Convention which makes conspiracy to commit genocide punishable. The reason behind this is that genocide is such a grievous and heinous crime that even an agreement to commit it or to plan to commit it without any practical follow-up is to be looked down upon. Let us not talk, now talk about not the conspiracy to commit genocide but the incitement to genocide. Incitement to genocide is criminalized. With respect to genocide in all international criminal courts. Since genocide is considered to be the worst of the crimes, therefore any attempt including the conspiracy to commit genocide and the instigation to commit genocide and incitement to genocide, they are all punishable. There are two conditions to this section which must be satisfied for a person to be held liable for punishment under the term incitement to genocide. First, the incitement must be public. The act of inciting people or provoking them must be done in a public place through speeches, demonstrations, etc. It can also be done through placards, posters, pamphlets or even through the medium of television or radio showcasing provocative statements or provocative uh, propaganda. Secondly, the incitement must be direct and must especially provoke the people engaged in committing the genocide, which means that it must not contain any vague or indirect suggestions. However, indirect references can be made as long as they drop enough hints to the cultural or linguistic background of the group against which the people are instigated. For example, referring to the Tutsi, 
in the context of the Rwandan genocide as cockroaches, using the Kenya Rwandan word inienzi, was enough to instigate them. An interesting case regarding incitement to genocide is the case of Rugiu, a journalist of Radio Mill Collins, who was charged with a direct and public incitement to commit genocide and crimes against humanity. An ICTR trial chamber found that the public radio broadcasts made by Rugiu were directed against the Tutsi ethnic community in Rwanda, calling for people to deprive them of their fundamental rights to life, liberty, basic humanity and dignity. Depriving this group of people on ethnic lines of these basic rights has the aim to kill and remove them from the population and to instigate the perpetrators of the crime and eventually all of the group of Hutus to commit a crime. We now come to a easier inquired crime that is ordering. Ordering happens when a DURE or de facto superior issues a command instructing the subordinates to follow a certain course of action or control which is unlawful and qualifies as a criminal offence. It was held in the Kordich and Circus trial chambers of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda that it is not required that a formal relation exist between the superior or the subordinate for finding ordering so long as the accused possess the authority to order. In conclusion from the above lecture, we have seen how the international courts and tribunals have dealt with certain categories of inchoate offences. We have also looked at what some of these inchoate offences are and how the courts have devised methods and precedents to prevent the start of an ethnic, racial, religious and various intra-regional conflicts that cause harm to humanity and destroy the peace. Courts have spotted the methods of planning for execution of the criminal idea by perpetrators and have enacted methods to penalize them for the act of planning even without it fructifying into a case of genocide. Through an analysis of the cases given here, you will understand how inchoate modes of liability work. Thank you.